Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. What a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Boy, I tell you, it's gorgeous here on the mountain this morning. Welcome to Jesus and Jeans Worship at the Cottage, and we're glad to have you here today. Especially uh, if you're joining us via the internet, we stream every every single week, and so uh, we want to thank you for joining us wherever you are. We literally stream around the world, and uh, so thank you for joining us. My name is Teddy Baker, along with my wife Jan, Jim and Sandra Pinner, Bobby and Dawn Privet, Chuck and Karen Watkins. They, uh, we want to welcome you here uh, to uh, Jesus and Jean's worship service. We've been uh, been doing this service for uh, over eight and a half years now. Boy, I tell you, it's, it's, it's become more than anything I ever dreamed about. So uh, thank you guys for uh, supporting the, the ministry. We're going to sing a little bit, do uh, some contemporary uh, praise and worship song, and then uh, got a great old hymn that uh, is probably one of my favorites. Uh, so everybody ready to praise the Lord? Yeah. Amen. Let's do it.
Give the Lord praise. Some folks we uh, want to pray for uh, this morning. I want to start off by just having a kind of a, just a wonderful praise here. We want to, we want to give uh, Jerry and Kathy Coleman. They're uh, celebrating 60 years of marriage here. That's amazing. God bless you. <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> oh boy, what a, what a beautiful, beautiful legacy. I want to continue to remember uh, Kaylin, uh, baby Ryan. We're going down in the morning to uh, get Jan's at home getting everything packed. She, you know, we pull a trailer when we get her stuff packed, and uh, <laughs> and then I get a bag. And so, so she's uh, she's getting getting ready to uh, to go out. We're leaving out early in the morning to go meet our grandson Ryan Lawrence, and uh, he's going to be good. But uh, one, of, one of the things, their whole family, uh, they, they all tested positive for COVID. And so the whole family has been going through different stages of, of COVID. And, uh, but they're saying that the baby is, is fine, you know, just because of the antibodies that uh, the baby's developed during birth. So just uh, pray for uh, continued health for, for Kaylin. And she's starting to get back to a little more normal. But uh, just that we can get COVID out of the whole family there. And, uh, and had all that I want to say. Well, I can tell you that. Kurt and Laura Mather, we're glad to have them back and want to continue to pray. <laughs> Bob and Janet uh, are not here with us today. Bob and Janet Seifer. Bob's uh, got a bad cold, still dealing with uh, what they think is bronchitis, so trying to get him to go to the urgent care. And um, uh, Janet's daughter, Crystal, uh, is in the hospital, and uh, she's going to have a pick line. She has a blood infection and it's a streptococcus infection in her blood. And so uh, she's gonna be in the hospital with a pick line for uh, at least four weeks uh, wow. to get the antibiotics uh, into her system. Don't know that she'll be in the hospital that, that whole time, but she'll definitely have the pick line. Uh, I wanna continue to pray for our, our good friend, uh, Harold and, and Cheryl Lesnia. It's uh, Cheryl and Harold been together for uh, over 20 years and just been, been, uh, she's just such a blessing, and so I want to pray for Cheryl and her family as they continue to grieve the loss of uh, Harold Bryce and our good friend. They're going to be doing a celebration of life for Harold at uh, Serenity Cellars on September the 12th, uh, and all the proceeds and everything. we got 12 different artists that are donating their time to come and perform and share stories uh, about Harold and uh, we're uh, dedicating the stage there and, and honor him, and so it's just going to be a great day. That's Tuesday, September the 12th. So, uh, and everything that we raise is going to uh, Hospice of North Georgia. Uh, I think you have to go online too. Yeah, you have to go online uh, to get tickets. So the tickets are like ten dollars uh, a piece, and that includes uh, a glass of wine or you know, your your beverage of choice, whatever they have there. So. I want to uh, continue to pray for Lynn Johnson. She got a great praise report. Uh, MRI, MRI showed no signs of cancer. So praise God for that. Amen. I want to continue to pray for Heather Leak. That's Anz and Bert's uh, daughter-in-law. She has leukemia, 58 years old. So I want to continue to pray for her. Uh, Zachary Dulac, Donna Dulac's son, brain, uh, brain tumor she's being treated for. I want to pray for uh, our good friend Susan South, uh, just ongoing health issues. Uh, John Belize's niece and nephew, Juanita and Marklin. I uh, got a text from Cheryl uh, Orihoski this morning that her, her best friend's daughter-in-law, Tori, that had the aortic valve replacement, is continuing to get stronger and just doing much better. So uh, we praise God for that, man. Uh, she's been, and now uh, if she continues to get better, she will eventually be able to get back on a list uh, to get a liver. So we got the heart fixed and now we got, got to get a liver for it. And so I want to continue to pray for her. Uh, Henry McMillan, uh, just ongoing um, health issues. Um, Lisa Reed's br uh, brother-in-law, Randy Fear, uh, he's been brought home and uh, under hospice care. Uh, just not doing well with fluid around his heart and some other issues that are going on. And so they decided he wanted to come home, and so now they've got him under hospice care. Uh, Morgan Wilkins, uh, tumor behind the retina. 
Maria Barbado, we want to continue to pray for the vertigo. Uh, Bruce Johnson, uh, Kim, our good friend Kim Johnson, her husband has uh, cancer. Uh, Steve and Kathy Schmidt, Joe Young is uh, their sister-in-law. We want to pray for Steve, too. They went on a trip. Steve came back and tested positive for COVID as well. So I want to pray for Steve, Joe Young, and then Steve's uncle, uh, Phil Nelson, who also has cancer. I want to continue to pray uh, for our two young folks, Hinton Dalton, that was in the car accident in Hiawassee. Uh, continues to, to do a, a little better. They're trying to get them in Georgia. Kate down in uh, South Georgia, she was uh, had a four-wheel accident, face uh, crushed. And so we just pray God's blessings in, in getting these, uh, these two uh, strengthened and, and healed. Uh, and then Corley Roundtree had a stroke, and uh, so I want to continue to, to pray for, for him as well. Yes. Amen. Karen yes. Karen texted and they're home because she's real sick with a bad cold. Who is? Karen Watkins. Oh, Karen. Karen. And, oh, okay. So pray for Karen. She's got a bad cold. Mm. Well. <laughs> yes. And Dave. We got Dave James has, has got, uh, he's got, uh, triple, bypass. triple bypass coming up next week, right? I'm the, I'm the only one they're going to have surgery on. My doctor, he's the number one doctor in cardiology. He said, I'll be walking the next day. Uh, and uh, he said, I'm going to have to have a surgery on my heart. And I said, well, I'll be back next week. And he said, well, I'm going to have to have a surgery on my heart. But I brought this Bible give to me in 1978. Amen. Well used, I can see. Amen. So say, Dave said, don't worry about me. I got, I got my 1978 version of the Bible. So he's going he to be reading that baby. Amen. Did I get everybody? I hope I did. Okay. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, what a joy it is to be able to gather together and worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we gather each Sunday to not only celebrate our life and celebrate all the blessings that you pour out upon us, but it's to, to really stop for a moment and, and try our best to engage with you as our Heavenly Father, the King of who we are. And so, Father, we do give you praise, uh, first and foremost, for everything that you do for us, in us, and through us. We just pray your blessings on our time together today. We lift up these prayer requests Father, praying, believing, and trusting that you're already in the midst of every situation, that you go for, before us through every trial and situation that we face in life. So thank you for being there. Thank you for being uh, the God that is uh, the great physician, the healing God, the compassionate God, the faithful God, the loving God, the grace-filled, mercy-filled we thank you for being who you are. We pray your blessings on our time together. Today, as I always ask, get me out of the way and let the power of your word ring through and true to our hearts and lives. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill this place. Fill our hearts and our lives. Change us from the inside out that we might be better prepared to engage the world around us that they might be able to see Jesus in us. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for loving us. And we pray these blessings this morning in the most powerful name, that of your son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. All right, well, this morning we're going to be finishing up a, a series that we started uh, three weeks ago, and it's entitled, The Bible Doesn't Say That. And we, as we move into this fourth week of this series, we're going to look at a, another familiar statement that, again, many people actually believe is, is in the Bible. They, they actually believe it's, it's in the Scriptures. And the popular saying that we're studying today that's not found in the Bible, the Bible doesn't say that, is the phrase, in, and we, we hear it all the time, forgive and forget. We've all heard this phrase, and maybe even some of us have used it at some point. You know, most often this phrase is used in an attempt to comfort someone who's been hurt by an, another, and they just can't get over it. And so oftentimes I hear people say, I've said it myself, you know, well, don't let it get, it, get you down. You know, just try to, try to move on. 
But a lot of people will add to this. They'll, re they'll say, now remember, you know, the Bible says that you are to forgive and forget. But the question is, can we really forget? <laughs> Charles Swindoll tells the story of a, a Jewish rabbi. His name was Saul Rosenberg. And who he one day he, he did something really stupid that, that terribly upset his, his wife, Ethel. And he apologized for it and his wife forgave him. However, from time to time, Ethel would mention what he had done. And so finally, you know, Saul finally asked one day, says, Honey, why, you know, why do you keep bringing that up? Because I, I thought your policy was to forgive and forget. And Ethel said, well, it is. I just don't want you to ever forget <laughs> that I forgave and forgot. <laughs> you know, if, if someone were to ask you to, to make a list of the people that have hurt you, you could, you could probably write out a long list of those that have cost you pain at some point in your life. I mean, these may be, it may come from family members, it may come from friends, it may come from co-workers, it may even come from fellow believers, fellow Christ followers. And so many relationships have been shattered because of cruel words and actions that have left those who have been hurt feeling somewhat betrayed. You see, you seldom forget the hurt or the pain that someone has caused you. And here's the important part. God doesn't demand that we do so either. God doesn't demand that we just forgive and just forget everything. Because God is very realistic about our ability to forgive others. He demands that we forgive. But he also knows that there are, are some hurts that have produced deep scars in our lives that will always be there. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.32, that's one of the verses that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at Ephesians 4.32, Hebrews uh, 8. And, and so and Paul uh, says in Ephesians 4.32 that we are to forgive as God has forgiven us. In fact, the whole, the entire verse says this. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And that's another one of those verses that is, uh, uh, it's an imperative statement. And again, when you see one of these verses, what have I always told you to do? You know, you, you put your name in front of it. Teddy? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. God's forgiveness of our sins is the basis, it's the foundation for us to be able to forgive others who sin against us. If you were to take a moment to, to think about the, all the sins that you've committed in your lifetime, I believe that, that we would all be amazed at how forgiving our Heavenly Father has been toward us, especially me, and especially our past life. Amen? Amen. I mean, we would, I think we would be surprised at how much God has forgiven us for. Even the Apostle Paul would refer to his past life. And he said he called himself, uh, and he saw himself as a persecutor of Christians. And he would talk about the mercy that God bestowed upon him, the worst of sinners. Listen to what he wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. He says this. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my insolence I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. 
He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. Here's a, a challenge for you. Go back in your memory as far as you can. And think about all the times that you've, you've disobeyed. Think about the times when you mistreated others, when you lied to make yourself look innocent. Maybe you stole something from a, a store or an individual, maybe a company that, that you used to work for. Maybe you got caught. How about the time when you were out of a job and you cursed God? I mean, think about it. Think about hurtful words you've said, gossip you've spread, friends you've betrayed, friends who have betrayed you. Now, I barely scratched the surface when it comes to listing all the sins that we can, we can deal with, all the ones that we've committed over the years, and I guarantee you, I got I can fill up a 30-gallon dumpster. <laughs> Barely scraps the surface. But the good news is this. If we have turned our lives over to Jesus, God has forgiven us. And not only just us, he's forgiven every single sin that we've ever committed or will commit. And because of that, the Bible tells us that we are to forgive those who sin against us. And the issue is not whether we should forgive. That's, that's a command. Like I said, that's an imperative statement that God gives us. It's the forgetting part that is the most difficult for us. There are some sins that have been committed against me that I will never forget no matter how hard I try then there are some sins that I've committed against others that I wish I could forget, but I can't. And so what does the Bible say about forgive and forget? This morning I want to share one truth about that, and then I want to share the solution that I believe will help us learn how to forgive and to forget. So first, let me share the truth with you. Number one, God does not forgive and forget. Now, I know when I say this that some of you may be reminded of a passage that you believe teaches that God forgives and forgets. And we're going to get to that probable verse here in just a moment. But first, let me ask you some questions uh, about some well-known biblical char uh, characters. How many of you know about the, the sin of adultery and murder that King David committed? Anybody remember that? Yeah. How many of you know about how Peter had denied knowing the Lord three times on the night that Jesus was arrested? Anybody remember that? Yeah. How many of you know about how Paul again known at that time, known as Saul of Tarsus, persecuted and arrested, tortured, even consented to the death of those who were the followers of Christ. Anybody remember that story of how Paul acted out toward the church? Okay, so if you remember these three men and their stories, then let me ask you this. How many of you believe that although these, these men had committed horrible sins, God had forgiven them. Anybody believe that? That God actually forgave them? Yeah, I do. I, I believe that. And so, consider this question. If God forgives and forgets, then how do we know about these men's sins in the first place? How do we even know? You see, the reason we know about the sins of Peter, Paul, and David kind of sounds like a 60s folk. <laughs> Yeah, the reason we know about Peter, Paul, and David is, is because God inspired many writers to record the sins of his people throughout history. 
people whom he had forgiven. Yet their sins with all of its ugliness are exposed right there on the written pages of Scripture. They are written there for all of us to read throughout the ages. So here's the thing. All the sins that you and I have committed throughout our lives, God remembers each and every one of them. Even though, even though, exclamation point, he has forgiven us. The, the verse that I mentioned is a, the probable verse that many people would like to turn to is actually found in Hebrews 8.12. And Hebrews 8.12 says this, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. You see, on the surface, it sounds like God forgives and forgets, doesn't it? But let's take a, a little deeper look. The Hebrew writer in this verse here is quoting scripture that is found in Jeremiah 31, 34. And so the writer of Hebrews is addressing Jewish Christians who were beginning to leave the faith. They had decided to leave the teachings of Jesus Christ and return to the old covenant, which was the law of Moses. And he is reminding them, the, the writer of Hebrews is reminding them that 600 years before that God, through the prophet Jeremiah, promised to give the Israelites a new covenant that was enacted in Jesus Christ and through which God will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. And so I want to delve into that phrase a little bit. Uh, remember their sins no more. Now, we've already established the fact that God does not forget our sins. From the first sin we ever committed to the one we committed this morning, He has forgiven us. But He knows every single sin that we have committed throughout our lives even the ones that we have forgotten. Here's, here's the difference. The Hebrew idea of remembering is different from our idea of remembering. T to us, to remember and forget, these are, these are mental activities that we have to sometimes get help for. You know, because it's going on between the ears. However, to the Hebrew mindset, to remember and forget our action words. It's just not a, a, a mental thing that, we're, that, that they were going on. They actually believed in taking action. So uh, let me illustrate that for you from Scripture, both in a, a negative and a positive way. In Hosea, in the book of Hosea, chapter 9, verse 9, it says this. It says, they, which he was talking about the Israelites, they have sunk deep into corruption. And God will remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. Even though that's a, a negative connotation, those are action words. That God would remember and that he would act. But again in Genesis 8.1, talking about the story of Noah, it says, but God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now, this doesn't mean that God was just, you know, taking a nice stroll in heaven one day, and all of a sudden he thought, oh my goodness, Noah. Man, I totally forgot about that guy. I mean, how long has that dude been on the boat? <laughs> no. God remembered Noah, and he sent a wind that was needed so that the waters would recede. So when scripture says that God remembers, it means that God renews his effort to work in that person's life. Does that make sense? 
So kind of get that in. When God remembers, it's actually his renewal. He's renewing his efforts to work in our lives. So first, when God remembers our wickedness, as in Hosea 9.9, 9, he acts to discipline us. That's what the Holy Spirit does to work in our life to bring us back to a place of repentance. And, and remember that that word repentance, we, you know, we get turned off by that a lot of times. But repentance is about, it, it's about realizing that you're going in the wrong direction. And then you make a concerted effort when you realize that you're going in the wrong direction. You make a concerted effort to turn and head in the right direction. And you bring those who are with you. You confess to them, hey guys, we were going wrong. Now we need to turn around and go back this way. That's what repentance is, is that you realize, okay, I'm heading in the wrong direction with you, God. I need to get back. I need to get back in the right place. And so I want to go and follow as the Holy Spirit leads me. Secondly, when, when God remembers his promise or his covenant, he acts to shower each one of us with his grace. When God remembers, he acts. And so when he remembers us, he acts toward us in grace. So, again, what did God mean when he said, I will remember your sins no more? Well, it doesn't mean that he forgets our sins, but rather those of us who live in the new covenant... Who have, we have given our lives to Christ. And we're, we're following him. We, we have become Christ followers. What it means is that God will not now or ever act toward us in the way that our sins deserve. That's why I tell you all the time, what I deserve is to be in hell with a broke back. That's what I need to, that's what I, I deserve. But that's not what God gave me. He offered me his grace. Here's one of my favorite sayings from Brennan Manning. Brennan Manning was just a great man of God, but he, he struggled with, within his own life and had his own struggles. And he wrote this. He said, God loves you unconditionally as you are and not as you should be because nobody is as they should be. We're all a work in progress every single day of our life. And God is continually working through the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out. That's why Romans 6.23 is such a powerful verse. For the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. But the gift, very powerful word, that word but. What we deserve, but that's not what we got. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's how God acts toward us. Does that make sense? So when you, when you actually realize, you know what, man, this is what I deserve. But that's not what we get. We get God's grace. Now will God discipline us? Will he do things to bring us back in line with the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. But here's the thing. Today, this promise that God extends to us is extended to everyone who will give their life to Christ. Why is that true for us today? It says in 2 Corinthians 5.19, it says, For God, the Father, was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So God, the Father, was in Christ Jesus. He was reconciling the world to himself. And it says that God was no longer counting people's sins against them. It doesn't say that God forgets our sins. It says that God chooses to no longer count our sins against us. Why? Because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Period. 
That's why I tell you all the time that when you go to God and ask forgiveness for maybe something that you're you're committing, you know, you're committing a, some struggle that you're having in your life, and God looks at you, and when He looks at you, He goes, "What sin? What sin?" Because you know, it's not because God has amnesia. I mean, you know, it's, it's not because He He He's somehow forgotten your sin. It's because that all He sees. It's Jesus. Jesus stood in our place. He hung on a cross and he, he, he fulfilled everything that we as humans could never fulfill. 2 Corinthians 5.19 also tells us that now because of this great promise and this great gift that God has chosen to do, not counting our sins against us, that now we as Christ followers have been giving this, we've been given this wonderful message of reconciliation to impact the lives of our, our friends, our families, even those that, that the Holy Spirit brings into our sphere of influence. So what's the solution to all of this? We are to forgive as God forgives. You know, since Paul said that we are to forgive each other as God forgives us, then how do we personally put that command into action? Forgive and remember their sins no more. I gotta tell you, I don't do well with that. I try to have a, a short memory, but there's just some stuff that just keeps raising up its ugly head that you have to deal with. Although God does not forget our sins, He chooses not to remember our sins and act against us. Again, there are, are, there are some offenses that have been committed against us that we will never forget. But we can choose to forgive and remember no more. Clara Barton, she was a, the founder of the American Red Cross, was a, a victim of a vicious lie told by a, a former friend. But she had forgiven her friend but years later, another friend came and had reminded Clara of the lie that was told about her. And, and when she ignored the comment and acted as if she had really never even heard of it, her friend recalled the conversation for her. And she said, don't you remember that? Clara Barton said, no. I distinctly remember forgetting it. So how do we do that? You see, when, when, when I forgive someone who has hurt me, how do I put remember no more into action? I want to share with you four what I believe are steps that we have to consistently make that effort. And I believe it will help all of us to forgive and remember no more. The first step is this. I will not bring it up to you again. When God said, I will remember your sins no more, that means that he will never bring up the wrongs done. He will never remind you of what you said and did in anger. He won't make you relive the hurt you caused your family, maybe during a time you were struggling. You see, when you forgive someone, you, you do not continue to remind that person what he or she did to hurt you. Remember the story I shared with you in the beginning, you know, the rabbi and his wife? I just want you never to forget that I forgave and forgot. No, I'll never bring it up to you again. 
Secondly, I will not use it against you. The Apostle Paul writes that love keeps no record of wrongs. That's 1 Corinthians 13, 5, the love chapter. And so when you forgive someone, not only do you not bring it up again, but you also don't seek revenge and try to hurt the other person in return. The third step, I will not talk about it to others. This is where remembering no more often breaks down. <laughs> you know, why, why do we forgive our spouse or our friend or our co-worker for something they said or did against us and then we turn around around and tell others about what they did to us? It's because we want others to know, you know, what a bad person he or she is. Is that the reason we're doing it? Is it because we don't want others to like that person so we vilify them? Is it because we just like playing the victim? I think the last one is probably pretty close. Whatever it is, doesn't matter. Whatever it is, when we say, I forgive you, it stops right there. No one else needs to know about how you've been hurt. And by gossiping to others about it, now you're sinning against that person, and then you need to go to him or her and ask for their forgiveness. We don't put it on social media. I read some of the stuff you guys post on Facebook. Stop it! <laughs> I, got, I got to where I just don't communicate that way on social media anymore. It's kind of like your grandmother always used to tell you. If you don't have something nice to say, what? <laughs> Keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything at all. It's very, very difficult sometimes. But if you're going to forgive and remember no more, consistently we have to take these steps. The last step is this. I will not dwell on it. I will not just keep going over and over and over in my mind. <clears throat> Paul said that God has given us the ability to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 10.5. God has given us that ability to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Now again, I know that there are some hurts that you'll never forget, no matter how hard you try. However, once we have forgiven someone, we are not to intentionally try to remember and dwell on the offense and just keep rolling it over and over and then this little bitty thing gets out here like, oh my God. And it's turned into something it never was meant to be. Don't try to relive the hurt. Let it go. How do you win a tug of war? Let go of the rope. Game over. And hopefully, even prayerfully, those hurtful memories will begin to fade more and more. Especially if you make the effort to rebuild your relationship with the one whom you have forgiven. You see, forgiveness... Forgiveness involves wiping the slate clean. 
I'm done with it. But let me share you a story just in my own personal life and ministry. It took me a long time to find Jesus. It took a long time for Jesus to find me. I was a knucklehead from the beginning. Continued to be one throughout my adult life. Until later on, Jesus captured my heart. But about a year and a half, two years after I felt God calling me in the ministry. And so I went to school and I started preparing. But then I got called to my very first ministry position. In the year of 2002, I was fired from my first ministry position as a, a worship pastor. And it was for no other reason than the pastor that I served under, a man that I had actually grown up with, I had known since I was a teenager, just decided on a whim that he wanted to go in a different direction with, with worship. A direction that he felt I couldn't handle. So he fired me. No notice. No real reason. Just, you're fired. You're out. And even though I understood his decision, the effects of his decision caused tremendous hurt to me and to my family. Affected our daughter Kaylin tremendously. She didn't even want to go back to church. <laughs> I had a mortgage. I was taking care of an aunt. I was caregiver for my aunt and uncle. Lived, they lived with us. And now here I am, you know, going, okay, I, I can do Walmart greeting, I guess. No job, no direction, no nothing. And I had been with the church since 1997, and, and I was committed to the vision, the values of this community faith, of faith that this pastor had set out. So, so much so that over the years, I had actually neglected my own family in order to make myself available to the needs <coughs> excuse me, that he set forth in our, our mission and our, our ministry statement. Every church has one of those. And so to say the least, I was, I was devastated. I mean, I was just blindsided. Hadn't been warned. We did evaluation. I mean, nothing. Just, you're out. And so I found that I began to develop some really deep resentment towards my pastor and more importantly, my, my friend. And one day as I was reading scripture trying to, to reconcile my heart in this situation, I came across these scriptures in Psalm 55, verses 12 through 14. And I want to read them to you. It says this, it says, If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you. A man like myself, my companion, my close friend with whom I, I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshipers. And so if you were to go to that page in my Bible, you'll see a date, you'll see a name. And you'll see two words written out in the margin. I forgive. And today our friendship is completely restored. Why? I chose forgiveness. I chose to forgive. It doesn't make me a better person. It let me off the hook that I didn't have to carry that around anymore and I could go back to loving my friend. You see, instead of being angry and bitter and hurtful over everything, every little thing that we've gone through in life, and some of them I know are not little things, they're, they're big things. And they affect us tremendously. But rather than being angry and bitter and hurtful, Paul says that we are to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ 
Jesus, God has forgiven us. In this verse, the Greek word that Paul uses for forgive, it means to let go of, to release, to remit. It's used elsewhere in Scripture to reference a canceling of a debt. But again, understand, please understand that forgiving and remembering no more does not come without sacrifice. You know, if you cancel a debt that's owed to you, that money doesn't magic, magically reappear in your account, does it? I mean, you can't, you can't spend it. You can't do anything with it. So obviously, as any business would have to do, you have to absorb the cost. And in the same way, forgiveness requires that you absorb the cost of certain outcomes of another person's actions towards you. Even if it causes pain. Because regaining trust, rebuilding a relationship with whom you've forgiven, that's going to take time. And, and some relationships, and I, I have them in my life, and I've seen them you know, throughout over 30 years of ministry. There may be some relationships that may never be the same. But still... God says, forgive anyway. 1 Peter 2, 24 tells us that Jesus absorbed the cost of our sins on the cross. We don't deserve it. We cannot earn it. Nor can we ever repay it. But God chose to cancel the debt of our sin to forgive us through his son, Jesus. Why? Not because of anything we've done, but because of what Jesus accomplished. Jesus was obedient to the Father, even unto death. God our Father chose because of Christ's obedience. He chose our Heavenly Father chose to remember our sins no more. This is how we are to forgive those who have sinned against us and then remember no more. It takes effort. But I believe our lives will be better for it. I want to close with one last story. There, there was a husband and wife who had been married for 20 years. And they were beginning to have more than usual disagreements. There was disagreements over with hurtful things being said. And so they decided that maybe the best thing to do was to list each other's faults, faults on a notepad and then discuss them in a, in a civilized manner. And so they sat down at the table across from each other and they both began writing and the wife wrote down five of her husband's faults and she put down the, the pencil. But then she noticed her husband still writing. And in fact, he was writing and then erasing. And then he was writing some more. And she thought, well, he must be trying to perfect his list. Well, I can do that too. And so she picked up her pencil and she started writing this long list. And then she flipped the page over and she started writing down the back side of the page and had this long list. And she wrote some more and kept writing. And after they were done, the wife handed her list to her husband. He's looking at the list. Leaves the top off the jelly jar. Doesn't put dirty clothes in the hamper. Watches way too much sports on television. 
snored too loud. On and on and on it went, one fault after another. Her husband told her how sorry he was and he said that he would try his best to improve on the, the things that she had listed. And then he handed his wife his list. And on each line, a fault was listed, then erased, and then written in its place were the words, forgiven. Again, Brennan Manning was a very powerful influence in my life. And he wrote this quote, he says, The outstretched arms of Jesus excludes no one. Not the drunk in the doorway, the panhandler on the street, gays and lesbians in their isolation, the most selfish and ungrateful in their cocoons, the most unjust of employers, and the most overweening of snobs. The love of Christ embraces all without exception. God has called us to do the very same thing. Be kind and compassionate. Do that to one another. Forgiving each other just as in Christ, God forgave you. I pray that we will be a people who will strive to make this verse come alive in our hearts as well as in the lives of those that the Holy Spirit will continue to send our way. And I promise you, if you are sensitive to that, if you were consistent in making that effort to forgive and remember no more, you'll be surprised at how many people the Holy Spirit will send your way because He knows He can trust you to forgive and remember no more. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, the life can be difficult at times, complex. The dynamic of the human condition never ceases to amaze me. And I pray, Father, that we would give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to work in our lives to help us to truly forgive and remember no more. Help us to follow the steps that you've laid out for us, that you've given us in your word. To be reminded of how much has been given to us in the sense of grace and mercy and love. That we might be able to look at the situations and conditions of the frailties of the human condition and still say, I forgive. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming.